Cosplay Community. I am Kristen Kalina from Mastermind Adventures. This is Keith West and Ariel Bruni. They are uh, some of the masterminds behind Dragon's Haven Summer Camp, which is an immersive interactive theater camp in Spencer, Massachusetts. Yep. See, I got it right that time. Oh, there we go. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be blossoming into more exciting and different programming in the future. So Keith contacted me a few weeks ago, kind of there aren't a lot of people in the space that we're working with kids and teens um, uh, using this type of, we call it adventure programming, they call it immersive, uh, interactive theater programming. Um, and I thought he'd be a great person to talk to for the community um, to make you aware that these exist because um, these programs are probably the closest thing to video games in real life yeah. that you can give your kids. Um, and uh, it's a really exciting way to help kids work on things like their social emotional skills. Um, you can even teach academics um, in, in, in some of the programming. Mm -hmm. um, really? But uh, yeah, definitely. So, so they're here to kind of talk to you about what they're doing and what their inspirations are and what keeps them going and maybe some things you guys can do at home uh, or how to find other programming maybe in your area or what to look for in programs in your area that might be in that same space. So thank you so much for Our pleasure. being with us to talk with the Let's Play community. Um, so, uh, so I kind of gave a quick overview mm -hmm. of you guys and your background, but why don't you kind of take a moment and sure. tell people a little bit more about you and, and how you came to be. Yeah, um, so I have been working in education for the past couple of years as a school teacher. Um, I had a year in high school, I had a couple of years in AmeriCorps, um, and the past couple of years I've been teaching sixth grade literature. Um, I've really enjoyed in teaching, getting to dive into different types of stories and have kids explore perspectives that are really different from their own, which winds up connecting to a lot of why I was really interested in Dragon's Haven when Keith brought the project forward. We had already been working together in um, like some theater immersive camp type settings. Um, and so I knew him and his work from that venue and I had been kind of the kid who grew up playing a whole bunch of pretend and playing a whole bunch of D&D &D and tabletop and not, like really just loving the whole theatrical thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that overlap of interests was an immediate draw. Yeah, awesome. Uh, for me, I do a couple different things. Most of my work is in debate. Uh, so competitive, uh, competitive argumentation, public speaking, presentation, and a lot of what is important for that and for discussion and such is being able to see things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So theater naturally works in really well there. I'm also a huge nerd, <laughs> so it means so everything. See from, yeah. Yeah, amen to that. Galactic reference, yes. props. So the uh, so being able to rope in those sorts of things and use that as a tool and use that kind of use a game as a tool tool for teaching mm -hmm. I, I think is an incredibly wonderful thing mm -hmm. that's also something that's a heck of a lot of fun and yeah. that, uh, like a lot of parents I talk to say where were you when we were kids sort of yes. thing I would have loved it as a kid and I'm uh, not a kid anymore the best I can do is provide it for people who still are mm -hmm. uh, so that's a lot of where I've how I've ended up where I am. Mm -hmm. uh, Ariel is someone, as she mentioned, I've had the chance to work with before and she is one of the most gifted teachers and curriculum developers oh, I've worked with. Oh. So being able to, to bring her on board has been an absolute boom. It really, you know, it's so important um, because I I, I'm also in the director, yeah. you know, uh, role. Um, when you see somebody who's gifted, who has that type of a thing, it is so important to bring those people in and because oftentimes they don't realize how gifted they really are. So it's a great avenue to help people celebrate, you know, their gifts. And, and, and I think that um, for us in this, in this space, um, there's so many creative people that are just like waiting to use, you know, some part of their brain that is creative, um, that it's really fun to be able to provide that space for them to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so talk a little bit about what is immersive theater. Mm -hmm. Um, and why it's such a great teaching tool sure. um, for kids and teens. Um, would you mind if I start off? Yeah, please do. So the basic idea, and actually, yeah, I think I'm going to talk to the, the camera since yeah. it's like right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talk to the uh, camera. 
<laughs> so the basic idea behind uh, what we call immersive theater, some people call live action role playing, different iterations of the same thing is, I don't know if any of y'all had choose your own adventure books when you were kids. Uh, I did and they were, I thought they were really, really cool until I like made the arbitrary decision to turn left, flip to page 27 and find out, found out my character died. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I, oh. Right. So yeah. as an idea, they were wonderful because not, instead of just reading a book, which I totally enjoy, yeah. I got to affect the story and be a part of it. So that ability to affect the story, we take and we magnify that through the theater lens, where people, rather than just choosing where you turn in a book, they get to create a character, play that character, and respond to events in the world as that character, and most importantly, shape the world as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, part of what we do, and I would argue one of the most important things, is that our world is persistent. So the choices that people make, you know, when the villager comes running up to you saying, you know, the goblins are raiding our village, whether you decide to negotiate a peace between the goblins and the villagers, or whether you decide to drive the goblins out of town, the world remembers that. And so when you come back, that village will exist, either goblins and villagers side by side, or goblins way out of the way and villagers there on their own. That will continue as a result of your choice. And so... In the immersive theater setup gives people the ability to create and play a character in a fantasy world that they find engaging and make decisions that have an effect on a story that they want to, that they want to know more about and a story that they care about. Uh, it's kind of the best of watching a good movie, reading a good book, being part of a good play, and being able to write it instead of just watching it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a way of like collaboratively building a world, yeah. like both the staff and the people who are attending this kind of camp. Um, a lot of times in education we talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic learning, where extrinsic is when you're motivated by things outside of yourself that are driving you, and intrinsic being like when you have that feeling of pull mm -hmm. towards something, and I think that this kind of setting winds up really building a place for and then rewarding that intrinsic pull kind of motivation, because like the world is going to focus on and form itself around the things that you wind up most curious about. Right. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So that's what we do. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of, and part of why we do it. Not only because we think it's a very entertaining thing, but for us that really becomes a tool to get to the ends of education. Mm -hmm. uh, so we utilize that kind of environment and that sort of participatory experience to help bring kids to educational concepts that we want to help them learn. I, it's, I, I've spent a fair amount of time teaching at both high school and college and sometimes middle school level, and one thing, and I, I'm betting you'll back me up on this, something that really motivates kids, like Ariel said, is the intrinsic motivation, that desire to make a difference. So kid, telling kids you'll need this for a test is a much poorer motivator than saying, if you'd like to be able to advance the story in a way you think is cool, this is going to help you out. Uh, so we encourage kids to learn the things we want as a way of shaping the story, and so they often make the choice on their own to seek out knowledge instead of having knowledge pushed at them, very much a pull rather than a push. Right. So is Dragon's Haven, does it have an academic component? In part. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have basically two major educational components to what we do, or two major areas we could divide them into. There is the adventure component, and then there's what we call the accolade system, uh, which is something that we've spent a lot of time developing and Ariel's been instrumental in. And the, uh, I'll let you probably talk a little more about the sure. accolades if that's okay. Yeah, um, so the accolade system is basically kind of formed around this idea that um, whenever you're in a traditional RPG setting, you wind up having those character classes, like your rogues, your adventures, your, you know, like various sorts of things. Um, RPG is role-playing game. Think Thank you. Dungeons and Dragons or Lord of the Rings game, you know, anything along those lines. Anything where you take on a character and then play that character it can be in various formats. Yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the ways that you can enact change on the world when you are inside of the game is by using certain skills. So for example, maybe if you want to free your friend who has been kidnapped by this ogre over here, you want to distract that ogre so that you can then get to your friend without having to engage with this enemy that is way more powerful than you. Mm -hmm. um, the thought behind the accolade system is that you would earn the skills by actually practicing something relevant mm -hmm. um, that would be tied there. And so, for example, um, the skill distract is connected to 
a stealth curriculum that we had where we spent a lot of time talking about like spatial awareness, noticing how your body is moving, and then like noticing how you interact with your environment and what in an environment is likely to give you away mm -hmm. if you are moving and trying not to be noticed. Um, and so those kinds of things where we're trying to connect pieces of the actual skill to what they will be using when they are entering an encounter, where encounter is just what we call like a situation that you're going to solve either okay, physically okay. or through, yeah, through role play. Okay, if I can jump off of that, yeah. um, the basic idea behind the accolade system is that the anything that you can't accomplish just by talking or by engaging in mock sword fighting or whatever, anything that anything supernatural or anything superhuman that you would want to be able to do, any of those powers, we wanted to make available, but we wanted to tie in an educational component. So uh, one of the other really good examples is first aid. Uh, so if I'm you know, going through the forest and we just fought some goblins and my friend got hit by a goblin, I'm sorry, are you okay? Yeah. Looks like you got hit on the arm oh, there. I did. Yeah, 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 it hurts. Well, your character is a little <laughs> less healthy than they were before, and if you get a few more hits, you might have to you know, go back and recover. If I want to heal you up and help you out, I need to learn a little bit to do that. So the power, first aid, which enables me to tend one of my companions, in order to get that power, I need to learn how to splint an arm. I need to learn how to identify heat exhaustion, how to treat it. I need to learn eventually how to do triage in a situation, uh, check for pulses, airway, breathing, circulation, etc. We have a registered nurse who actually ran our entire first aid curriculum. So to gain that in-game power, you go through and learn things that have real-world applications. And once you've mastered those concepts and can demonstrate them and show that you've learned them, we give you a uh, little icon, a little talisman that you get to put on your, your necklace or put on your, your costume that then grants you access to that power inside the game. It had actually been really cool during our first run of the camp. Um, each accolade has what we call a capstone where you know like you might be learning different individual lessons to learn different pieces of a skill. Your capstone is supposed to like take each of those pieces that you learn and then give you sort of like an all-encompassing test where you can demonstrate your knowledge. Um, and the Captain Stone is supposed to be like kind of a challenge. And so we had some campers who had to attempt their Capstone for first aid multiple times. But it was really, really cool to watch them walking together afterwards after they had all yeah. already earned the accolade. And they were actually like kind of comparing notes on challenges that they had run into when they were doing their Capstone and trying to figure out, well, wait a minute. When you did it, it worked like that, so like, why was that situation different from what I did? And like, still puzzling through that, even though they had already accomplished, you know, that in-game token mm -hmm. that they had been looking to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, for context, the, the capstone in the first aid one, for example, actually is a triage situation. We get a number of our actors to come in, and we either, and this one we didn't have the chance to, but in the future, we will do makeup and stuff on them where they are evidencing different injuries. Mm -hmm. And the job of the, the person, the, the character who's trying to get the ability, they come in and they need to identify what the major injuries for each of these people are, prioritize them, which ones are immediate treatment needs, which ones can wait give people things to do, like you hold pressure on this wound while I check this person who's in shock and make sure that they're set and they're done with, and then prioritize those correctly and then treat them correctly. If they, if they mess things up or they make mistakes, then they talk with our trainer, who in this case was our nurse, uh, D Super, who was amazing and awesome, and that's actually her name and she is actually that cool. Um, <laughs> but <pretty>. then they, <laughs> Super Nurse is great. Uh, but then they talk with her and she explains, all right, well, here's what you missed here. You did this and that means you're not checking for this thing, so next time look for that. Then they'll step outside, the actors will change what they are doing, change their symptoms, they'll come back in and they'll try it again until they get it right. Mm -hmm. So that kind of a thing, again, the real world component, and it definitely is something they take with them when they leave. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, we have accolades that cover a range of different things. We'll be rolling out a few additional ones every year, but so far we have the stealth one, which is a lot about spatial awareness and a lot about patience and understanding your environment. Uh, we have another one that is public speaking and oratory oriented, which for some odd reason I'm kind of focused on, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, deals, uh, that deals with that kind of presentation, being able to speak in front of a group effectively. We have first aid one. We'll be introducing, actually, in our, in our world, there are occasionally ghosts and spirits out there. If you want to talk to a ghost, so there's an accolade that lets you do that. Um, the <laughs> I medium. love that. And here's That's the catch. Awesome. I, we work that. <laughs> and the way the curriculum around that, because learning to talk to ghosts isn't really a real world transferable skill. Yes, it is! 
Okay, we can have that discussion. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> most people, most of society writ large, if I put that on my college entrance exam, it's not going to get me as no, far as I want. No, that's true. It's not an academic but, skill. <laughs> but what we do for that, is, the curriculum is active listening oriented. Mm. The whole idea is in order to really understand what some alien being or alter, some ghost is saying and, and really process it, mm. you need to be able to not only listen effectively, but put yourself in the position of the speaker. Have empathy for where they're coming from, understand what their circumstances might be in the context that they're coming from in order to really in internalize it. So the real world skill that they take out of that is actually something that you know, CEOs, business leaders, colleges are consistently telling us is missing in our students mm -hmm. and the classroom education very rarely provides. Mm -hmm. And then we tie that to an in-game fantasy thing that reaches what the kids are most interested in being able to do. Now this segues really conveniently into the other half. So we talked yep. about how one half is the accolades and the other half is the interactive piece of maneuvering through the world on your adventures. And like, well, what can be learned there? Before we go there, can we give them a quick idea of what a day might look like, just so they kind of have an idea of what the, like, when they show up, what they might be doing? Unless you're already going to go there and I just cut you off, in which case I feel bad. Uh, don't feel bad. Okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so, an average day, we would start off with, like, breakfast, just kind of, like, warming up to the day, and end of breakfast would be game start. So, from that point on, Anything that is in the world is going to be something that is in character that is part of the adventure. Um, and so you might walk out and run into another character who might have some kind of conflict that they're trying to handle or solve that you can help them deal with or you can connect them with maybe somebody else who specializes more. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll have kind of like side adventures, things that might be just sort of wandering through the town that you can optionally engage with, and then we'll often have kind of like a a big looming issue that you will be looking to engage with. And so, for example, um, something that we wound up engaging with pretty early on in our last run was we found out that um, what was powering the world's ability to pull in more heroic people um, was on the fritz. And so they had to figure out why. They had like some documents that kind of gave them some information, but they weren't always entirely clear or reliable. And so they were like puzzling through some of that on their downtime. Then they might run into a character who has a little bit more information. It's like, oh, wait a minute, we read a letter about that a little bit ago. So wait a minute, what did the letter say again? And how does that help us figure out what to do here? Um, and then of course there is sometimes physically engaging with enemies, people who mm -hmm. um, are not really super eager to sit down and yeah. <laughs> hash it all out the nice way. Um, and so there's a little bit of trekking through the woods, there's a little bit of um, kind of sitting down and mulling and puzzling things through, and then there's always going to be, at the start of the day, a set chunk of time to engage with the accolade system that is just set aside for accomplishing um, the introductory levels of some of these skills. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody, like in a three-day weekend, everybody was able to achieve yeah, one that. of <laughs> the accolades. Yeah, so we had like one block of time that was specifically set aside for that. But then if they were interested in pursuing that further and they were like, oh, that was actually really interesting. Yeah, I definitely want to learn that skill. They could at any point in the day approach the instructor of that accolade and say, hey, so I know that there's another level of my training here. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we do the next step now? Can we make time for that? Mm -hmm. So those yeah, are awesome. kind of our yeah. main chunks. So the adventure... add in there? Yeah, I'll yeah. just jump off on the adventure thing real quick because yeah. I think that covers both of them pretty well. Uh, so the, the accolade stuff is the more directed curriculum. These are the things to learn. We teach them to you in a cool way. The adventure system is more of an organic way of doing learning. So there it's bringing the kids experiences that they then have to interact with in a useful and productive way. Mm -hmm. So it might be solving disputes between different people who are into one another. Mm -hmm. It may be trying to under, trying to unravel logic puzzles and mysteries. It may be having to take different ideas that the different people in the group have and decide what the best one we should pursue is. Discussion mm -hmm. facilitation. Mm -hmm. uh, all the kinds of soft skills and social skills that are incredibly essential, but again, classroom education doesn't focus on in the same way, which is part of what we would argue makes us very necessary and helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, no. 
so, the sun is so right necessary. in my eyes. So. Oh, you okay. know what? That happened to me earlier. Nope, you're good. you're good. I'm good now, too. <laughs> I'm just going to be on we, the edge of my seat. This morning, I was sitting talking to somebody. We intentionally sat under shade. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we were done, I was like fully in the sun. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, the That's, sun it's moves. It's trekking that yeah. way. So I'll be like, <laughs> Leaning over the table. Leaning in towards the camera. Yeah. yeah, no, but that's that's very, very true. And that's, I think, uh, why there is... It does seem like there are... Well, I just went to the uh, Living Games Conference. Did mm. you guys yeah. know about that in Boston? Did, yeah. you, did you attend? I think it was, uh, that was the one that was about a month or so In now? May? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. next year, I'll make sure. Yeah, I was actually there for, oh, a part, for one of the days. Oh, yeah. good, good. Which yeah. day did, did you go to the um, Thursday? The, no, I went oh. to the, the one of the weekend days. So we we went on Thursday, which was mm. the Edulerp yep. uh, educational yep. live action role playing uh, uh, session, and uh, we did the presentation on uh, our therapeutic programs yep. primarily. Yeah. Um, but uh, but there are there are a lot. There seems to be a lot of people focusing on this space. It seemed mm -hmm. like more than I really knew. I knew yeah. of a couple of programs that were here in Boston, um, you know, kind of like some of the overarching uh, programs that are more on the national level. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many people working in the space and so excited about the space because, you know, one thing that the video game can't do for kids is really teach those kind of face to face skills. Yeah. Um, and that's why we primarily focus on that, whether it's tabletop gaming or, or live action gaming. Um, and the kids really respond to it and they really, it's like they want, they want to, you know, they want to be, um, you know, more engaged with, with the world around them. It's such a great way for them to learn those skills, uh, because it does get their attention. I think that's the question that a lot of people will say, well, you know, nothing else can hold my kids attention the way that this can. Um, can, I, can I jump off on yes, that a little? Yes, please do. So yeah. This is a, a bit of a ramble, so yeah, forgive me no, if go you're going down. I'm, I'm dodging the sun. Again. All right, there we go. <laughs> in, out, so. in, out. There we go. It's like you're what? You're in the sun. Uh, yes. yeah. no, the vampire if I were a little earlier. taller, I could probably block it <laughs> for you. Uh, but, so I'm of the opinion, so I, I was very much a video game kid, and I still enjoy video games yeah. quite a bit. There's a lot I think that's useful, and in some cases a lot that's beneficial to mm -hmm. them, but as my mom will definitely tell you, moderation and all things right. is an important deal. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of what makes video games so good, there are actually, I think, three factors that make video games really compelling. Mm -hmm. And if we want to try to get kids, not away from them entirely, but if we want to pull, we want to make sure that that is not monopolizing their time, what Ariel talked about in terms of pull factors and push factors is super important, because trying to push them away from games, I think, tends to create resentment or frustration. They very begrudgingly, okay, I went outside, I tossed the frisbee, can I come back and play right, now? Yeah, yeah. Right. The push factor, I think, is a short-term solution at best and tends to get low buy-in. I think the much better way to do it when we're able, it's harder, but possible, is pull which means we want to be able to set up something that gives them what video games give them, but also gives them other good stuff, mm -hmm. and does what video games do that pulls them in as well or better. Mm -hmm. I think that's how we pull kids over. Mm -hmm. So the three things that I would argue video games provide uh, exceptionally well, and the, the combination of the three is part of what gets kids there, is autonomy, community, and advancement. So let me get into those a little bit if I can. Uh, on the autonomy level, especially as kids, uh, regardless of age, there's not a lot you actually have control over, and that kind of sucks, right? Like, you're, you're this big. You, you don't get to make a lot of the decisions about how your life is going to go. Some, like, as you get older, or depending on parenting styles, there may be more or less there, but a lot of the big decisions in life, someone is looking over your shoulder to helping to make for you. And this is actually something that I think has changed a lot over the generations, and we're always talking about how things were different when we were young. I'm getting old enough that I can actually do that without having to fake the, the old person thing as much. But one thing that we've got good evidence to suggest has changed is even as much as one or two generations ago, kids were let outside to just run around freely and then come back hours later much more easily. In the, the 70s and the 80s in particular, the, the mass media did a great job of scaring us about things like child abduction and whatnot, which are statistically practically nil, but mm -hmm. terribly scary when they happen. So because of that, we gave kids a lot less unsupervised time where they can make decisions on their own and then deal with the consequences of those decisions. We're also very worried about our kids' well-being, and we don't want them making mistakes that are going to hurt them, and that's a very legitimate idea. Mm -hmm. But one of the appeals of a video game setup is especially, and this is true, more true for some games than others for all this stuff, I'm over, I'm over some fine a little bit, but uh, like if I'm playing Legend of Zelda, right, I get to decide where I go. There's no one looking over my shoulder that says, no, 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 you can't go down to the valley over there. Unless you have like a really annoying brother. True. <laughs> so true. I don't have a brother, I have a sister, and she didn't want to I have a brother. Yeah, I, I got lucky there. <laughs> yeah. but, so, barring that, I totally 
And fair point. Yeah. Barring that, I get to decide whether I go down there or not. I get to decide, do I buy this new power or not? Do I go talk to this person? Like, all right. of those choices are in my control, as are the consequences for those choices. Right. And I think this is the really important part of the autonomy thing. It's not just being able to make choices. It's being able to make choices that have meaning and have consequences that I get to I get to cope with. Uh, it's the concept of agency. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's one that you know, the audience is familiar with. Uh, making choices that matter and that have effects. So video games provide that. And there are other ways to get that, but not a lot of them in our world uh, for kids right now. So if we want to pull them away from games for a massive chunk of time, we need to give them something else that gives them autonomy on that level. Mm -hmm. Try something like a really useful piece of real world prep too. Oh, like God, I remember, yes. you know, like that first like bit of going to college when yeah. there's like no adult sitting over yep. your shoulder saying, get it done, mm -hmm. get it done. And like, having to like kind of sort of scramble and find that place yeah. and drive and so it's like great when you actually have a way to practice that where the consequences are you know play consequences mm -hmm. you're bought into them emotionally but yeah. they're not real mm -hmm. yeah no yeah. very and a lot of what we try to do is create parallel situations mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. kids can experience both the good and the bad on a parallel level in a way that doesn't hurt them but prepares them for reality yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the autonomy I think is the first part. The second part is community, and this is something that is, I think, hard for some parents to see because if you've grown up in a different age, it's hard to understand how sitting at a computer alone constitutes community. But in ways, at least perceptually, it does, right? They're the, the person, the 30 other people that I'm more of, oh, 39 other people, it's a full raid, uh, old school Warcraft, uh, that I'm playing with when I'm raiding Anoxia's dungeon or going for Black, Lim, Black, Wing, Black Wing Lair, me talk good. Uh, like, those are people that I'm actively talking with right. and actively engaging with. Yeah. It's not the same as face to face. It builds some skills, but not all of the skills we want them to build. But there is a sense of community there, and that sense is important. Mm -hmm. Doing something like reading a book doesn't give you that sense of community in the same way. And so that's something that video games often will provide. Mm -hmm. But the third part I think is also really big and it's something that education and that job training people are, and that uh, executives are really starting to learn now and that's the if you've heard of the, of the gamification of education I hate the term because it feels tremendously artificial but uh, that's the concept of advancement that when you do something you want there to be meaningful progress where I can like say I've gone here tunk, I have done this thing I don't need to do that thing again now I have achieved it mm -hmm. uh, and video games are really good with that when I beat a level I beat that level I know that that's done I'm good mm -hmm. uh, when I acquire a thing I got that thing mm -hmm. etc and this is something where books will kind of give you that like I've, I've gotten to this chapter tunk, so books are good with that but a lot of other activities aren't if I play frisbee Okay, so I'm gonna uh, play frisbee. Is great. I love it. Uh, not as much as I should, uh, but I love it. It's, it's it's enjoyable, but it doesn't have that sense to it. Sports have some of that, but not the kind of enduring quality in a lot of cases. So trying to find something that ticks all three of those boxes, I think, is really important to pulling kids away. So we want an activity where they get to make choices that matter, where they get to uh, have a community that they can connect with, and where when they make progress, that progress sticks and they can clearly see that it's happened. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Their ephemeral progress isn't quite the same. Like, I know I got better at studying because mm -hmm. I did it more, mm -hmm. but mm, right. being able to have a clear marker, I think, is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So finding ways to replicate all three of those things simultaneously, I think, are important. And that's, I'm a little biased here, but that's part of why we landed on what we did, yeah. because immersive theater and the live action role play kind of thing gives kids all of those things. Right. They make choices that they care about for a character that they've decided is important because they created it. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a community that is present not only during the game, but after and outside of it. And there are clear, like with the accolade system, clear examples of when they have achieved a thing and they can mark that off and know it. Mm -hmm. So I think my opinion is the best way to get kids away from games is give them something that does what video games do, but better. Mm -hmm. Just saying video games are bad is a starting point, but it's not really a starting point for meaningful dialogue mm -hmm. with the kids. who are like, no, they're good. Well, that's the end of the discussion. Right. Uh, so I think that's that's my long spiel mm -hmm. on, on those sorts of things and how to work with them. I think that there are ways to do that outside of the system that we're doing, and there are things parents can do. Mm -hmm. Setting up interactive games with your kids. Mm -hmm. Rock on. Enjoy. Have fun. Like Those things may work out well. Now, granted, if they're teenagers and you're their parents, because eh, mm -hmm. if parents are doing it, it can't be cool. Mm -hmm. But like that aside, I think that there's a lot that, you, that can be done on that level, and groups and people to look for that do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 you're here to talk. That's, that's why I asked you to be on Point. on the video, is uh, so that fine. you can talk. 
Um, so we've talked a little bit about some of the skills, a lot of the different skills that kids can learn through these types of systems, you know, why they're beneficial. Um, so uh, let's talk about what are your, what inspires you? What are your sources of inspiration? What is the thing that is like, you see, you know, or, or, or even resources that you've gone to that kind of, uh, you know, help inspire more of what, of what you guys are doing? Yeah, well, I think like we both definitely have, and pretty much everyone who's involved definitely have a background of like really like nerdy interests and like yeah. fantasy sci-fi type scenarios that are just a world that's so completely different from our everyday world that but I have like to say, the, I don't want to interrupt you, yeah. but mm -hmm. I have to say the nerds are kind of in charge right now. I know. And it's well, way more mainstream than it used to be. Like Trek. Marvel, yeah. you know, um, no, you know, yeah. stuff like Star Trek and yeah. Star Wars. I mean, it's it's pretty mainstream now. Much so. You know, much more information so than age. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So anyway, yeah. but, but, totally yeah, but yeah, yeah. Totally so, legit. I mean, we do still kind of feel like outliers, but... We are not as we're much kind as we used of, to be. Yeah, we're yep. kind of the cool kids now. <laughs> I, don't know, I wouldn't go quite that far. Well, uh, I would say that we made it cool. Yes, uh, go we totally yes. did. I love that. I'm going to yeah. own that one. <laughs> so you're welcome in from H also. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of that type of background. Um, oh my goodness, I got Do you rephrase the question. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I said, so. what are the things that inspire you? So, oh, yeah. yeah um, for nerdy interests. Inversely, things that I get really frustrated when I can't do them as much in the classroom. Um, so a lot of times when I'm working in a classroom, there's so much academic material that needs to get done. And that material is important. Like it's preparing students in ways that they absolutely need to be prepared mm -hmm. in order to enter our world and be successful. Mm -hmm. um, but you often don't get to give as much airtime in the class to that, um, that social piece and that collaborative mm -hmm. piece. And even like some of the ways that we structure grading and that kind of thing can be like very competitively framed right like a lot of kids like kind of seeing themselves as a number and so mm -hmm. um that kids getting to call the shots and then helping them reflect on mm, well this was the outcome when you tried that let's mm -hmm. kind of evaluate why that happened and then like think through how we would do this differently mm -hmm. like it would it's frustrating when you don't get to make as much time for that and so it's really cool to have a venue that's very explicitly devoted to that kind of thing mm -hmm. I remember um, an early experience that is kind of, it was one of my uh, kind of first inspiring instances of being able to fuse the two a bit. I had, um, I was doing tutoring for one of the schools that I was working at, um, and there was a student who was, he very typically had a long period of time getting used to new adults in his life, and he didn't really like to talk or open up to new adults. Um, and so we had been trying to figure out for ages, like, what was going to get him to engage with the work that we were putting in front of him. And I heard from somebody who had worked with him the previous year that he was, like, a little bit of a low-key nerd. Um, and he really liked Star Wars. Um, so I needed to get him to do this certain branch of math. Mm -hmm. um, and wound up putting together a packet that was, like, planning out a space colonization mission uh, and then having to like determine um like what different aspects of the ship was he going to build up how is that going to fit into the budget mm -hmm. how are they going to stock all of these supplies so mm -hmm. that they fit in the cargo hold and that kind of thing um he wound up making uh he wound up doing the packet first of all which was really exciting yeah. um he decided to just sort of ignore the budget constraint that had been placed there <laughs> by a little bit but definitely ignoring it um, and so I wrote him, like, a letter from a fake supervisor, um, asking him to justify his budgetary considerations. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this was still in the point, he, he didn't like talking to new adults at all either, and so he didn't like talking to you directly. He would just kind of, like, do the thing, and then he would, like, put it to the side. Um, so he went up to one of the adults that he had worked with the previous year, like, holding the letter, and he looked at her, and he's like, what is this? <laughs> and she, she picks it up and she looks at it and she goes, looks like a letter. Yeah. For you. Yeah. And he like, looks back, walks back, it's like, okay. Um, and right, like, it's not like that 
single instance changed the entire trajectory of um, our dynamic and everything was Roses and Daisies from then on. But it was definitely a way of meeting him and engaging him mm -hmm. in a place that mattered to him as opposed mm -hmm. to trying to impose yeah. mm -hmm. my passions on him. You got his buy-in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was awesome. I'm going to check my time. Sorry, I have to okay. do this by oh, standing yeah. up. Okay, we're good. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, so, yeah, no, I think that that's really important because we really have to meet kids where they are. Um, and they are, one thing that has surprised me in running a lot of library programs, we do a lot of library programs and community centers and yeah. where we're getting kids that are not choosing to come to, well, mm. they are still kind of choosing, I guess. Yeah. They still have to choose to go. But right. still, yeah. it's it's like, it's a wide net, right? And you... And when we first started doing them, I had this concern, and I think I've talked about it before in one of the interviews, that I don't know if the kids are going to get into making yeah. characters and having a, a power or whatever. Not once in all of the programs that we've done have we come to a group of kids where I've had a kid go, ah, that's dumb, or ah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. They are in it. They are ready to make that character. They're ready to choose their powers. Mm -hmm. And there, it's it's very natural to them that this is where you know um, I was talking to somebody earlier today. You know I'm 45, so my generation was pretty much the last generation to not grow up with video games. Atari yeah. came out. I think yeah. I was 10. Yeah, it eight or 10. I don't know. My 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 brother was really really psyched about it, and um, I was like, cool, we have this thing. Um, but he was really really into it. I want to say I was between eight and ten, and so every generation after us mm -hmm. has been digital natives. They've grown up with mm -hmm. these things. So something like you know presenting them with something like here, make a character, mm -hmm. you know, um, make choices about what kind of powers that this character has, or what you know you only have this many points to spend, and you've got to choose. They love it, and they're into it, and they they you get that buy-in that you're talking about, like, right away, especially if it's within a space of something that they're already interested in, like Star Wars, mm -hmm. you know, or, or other literature, or, or a video game. I mean, we yeah. do a lot with, you know, kind of parallels, um, you know, we do Nerf games and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, Fortnite right now oh, is yeah. bananas, right? We just yep. we just uh, we just uh, scheduled a program. I saw it. At yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a Fortnite inspired program. But yeah. while we have them, we're going to try to teach them a little bit about engineering, wonderful, and teamwork That's and perfect. other things. So, um, so I do think that that is a huge key if you're going to mm -hmm. try to you know do other things with kids is kind of getting that that buy in. I've also kind of talked. Do you guys know what letterboxing is? Kind of my weird thing. Please, no. <laughs> enlighten me. Oh, you guys are gonna like this. What is this. letterboxing? So you you know what geocaching is? Yes. So it's pretty much that, except mm. instead mm. of a coordinates, it gives you step by step directions. So you're looking for the oak tree, and you're looking for the big rock, and you're looking for okay. the whatever different kinds of actual yeah. uh, points. You could, if you were looking as a family to do something like this. Mm -hmm. Take a letterboxing adventure yeah. and skin it yeah. as Easily. as a as a uh, you know adventure in one of their favorite stories. Yeah, I like um, that. fairly easily. So yeah. that's a way. That's kind of a quick shortcut way that you might mm -hmm. be able to do something like this. Um, you know, with your own family. Yeah. yeah. On a similar note, I've definitely heard of situations where like um, a person would kind of take on a character of their own and write letters from the perspective mm -hmm. of that character and kind of like establish a correspondence. Um, there was one, we had a, one student who was like really struggling, um, with literacy, like was not at grade level and it was really difficult to get him to write down words, even though he was super talkative and super social, mm -hmm. but right, like he still wanted to have those social connections. And right. so the teacher had done like a kind of clever thing of setting up a pen pal uh, dynamic where she's like, oh, you're going to write a letter to one of my friends. And suddenly the kid was like, yeah, I'm going to write down what kind of card do you like? How do you spell? How do you spell mm, what? <laughs> yeah. right? um, that kind of thing. And then you can always, we're going to keep looping it back to the nerd culture mm -hmm. thing. You can always take the nerd spin of like picking a favorite book or right. movie character yeah. and kind of like writing the correspondence from mm -hmm. the perspective of that character. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. So, um, so what is the greatest lesson or surprise you guys have learned in taking on this adventure of starting your own immersive theater camp. <laughs> oh, 
I think you like this question. I'm not sure. No, <laughs> I'm just like overwhelmed by the, by the question. There's a list. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think one of my go-to favorite moments was letting them lean into the starting awkwardness a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. so much of the immersive theater kind of thing does feel like a different modality, like mm -hmm. different from the way that you're used to thinking and engaging. Like, it feels a little odd at first to walk up to a person who's in this like colorful costume and has their face painted and also has like pointed ears and a weird nose yeah. and like going up with them and just striking up a conversation going hey whatever you are yeah, what yeah. is it that you're about um and so there were like those starting moments of them kind of like looking at each other being like is this okay kind do of we yeah. can <laughs> i um but right like getting to lean into that and then just kind of give the guiding notes from there and find the questions that will like help kids think about a facet of a problem that maybe they hadn't been considering mm -hmm. before right like how to not give away the answer to a situation yeah. but mm -hmm. ask the question that's going to get them yeah. that's thinking a, in the right direction i've talked about that a few times yeah. with different people that's very mm -hmm. it's a skill yeah it's yeah. a skill you have to practice because it's not it's not intuitive as as an adult and that's as you're talking from the adult's perspective yeah. right yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. been, like, really cool because, right, like, they started off the weekend when we did our first run of the camp kind of, like, doing the dewy, mm -hmm. nervous glance at each other, and then when we had, we had, like, a mock trial yeah. as one of our final encounters, and it was so cool to see, like, just over the course of, like, two days-ish, yeah. Yeah. how much they had progressed, where yeah. they were, like, coming together, they were discussing things, they were asking each other questions, and then they were, like, picking a person to then speak and mm -hmm. present to what mm -hmm. they had discussed as a group and they were trying to pick different people to speak each time so that no one person had the floor oh, the yeah. entire time and it was just like we that's didn't so even have thoughtful. to ask them to it. Like, yeah wow our kids are great empathy um, yeah. and that's that's actually for me the biggest thing yeah. like I, i'm of the opinion it's uh, the three things that the, the camp is about ideologically are compassion or empathy um about teaching critical thinking and about helping to, to build communication skills and i'm of the opinion that and if there was one skill that I could give to people and in so doing solve most of the world's problems, it would be empathy. Mm -hmm. Actually, stealing that from a former colleague of mine because it was a great answer on mm -hmm. it to a question. But a lack of empathy, I think, is the root of the vast majority of problems we run into socially and culturally. So helping to build that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're able to do and a lot of what we strive to do is help for kids to understand the perspective of others and to put themselves in someone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, theater here as an activity in general is really beneficial there because definitionally, you're stepping into a character that isn't you, and so you have to see things from someone else's perspective. But it goes even one step further, I think, when you are helping to create the character into whose perspective you will step. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Helping to see that is really cool. There was a great example, and this is actually from uh, the first camp that we we did. Uh, there, so one of the other uh, quests the kids had, they were there was this building they needed to get into. Uh, in order to get into the building, they either needed to get like claws from a werewolf, uh, and, and use werewolf claws to scratch a thing in the, in the in the door in order to get in. There are two ways you can arrange for that. You can either you know, get the claws from a werewolf, sorry, Mr. Werewolf, or you can convince the werewolf to just go do it. Uh, and they, we had planned mostly for the former, knowing it might be the latter. Uh, and so we had this, we had someone in you know, theater quality costuming and makeup and furs and claws uh, out there as, you know, as an injured werewolf the kids came across. Uh, and you know, the werewolves in our world are, are very rage oriented and <laughs> passion focused. Uh, and so you know, the werewolf is, he's, he's injured, cornered beast sort of thing, really angry and frustrated. And the kid's first response was, Oh, it's hurt. We're gonna put down our weapons. See, we're not a threat. Aww. We just learned first aid. How can we help you? Oh, and I'm like, oh, I love that so much. We win. <laughs> we win. Uh, it took them a while, and, and they had to work for it because yeah. the world was tremendously non-trusting. But bit by bit, they got there wow. and convinced the werewolf to help them, and then they arranged for a place for him to stay overnight, and that they would guard oh, him so that no one would hurt him. Oh, that so werewolf cool. will show up again in the future, yeah. and that will be an enduring character. Yeah. And it's an example of kids choosing empathy and compassion when they could have chosen violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one who thinks that I think violence is often the wrong answer, though not always. There are some things that need to be fought. Uh, and so putting that choice in front of kids and showing them 
and having them help to determine the ethical opportunities for when it is or is not okay and how we sort all that out and especially seeing them make a compassionate choice when they don't have to um like to me that's what keeps me going yeah, um absolutely. one of the the problems that at a previous place i worked we ran into a lot uh, in trying to do something somewhat similar is we put out some terrifying bad guy and the kids would make friends with it yes and we're yeah. like well okay so i guess the doom lord of skull mountain is now their friend uh we need a new bad guy yeah, uh, we yeah. All right, but, that's the And we roll with it, and then, then it turns out the reason the Doom Lord of Skull Mountain was a problem was because of his boss, who's this guy who's a real jerk. Go yeah, deal yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. it's yeah. seeing kids choose compassion and helping to teach them the skills yeah. and the understanding they need to do with yeah. that. For me, that's all. Everything. We had a moment in uh, the therapeutic uh, live action game mm. um, that we ran um, where the last. Uh, uh, set of mods that modules that we that we ran for this school mm -hmm. um, they were in a construct and they had to um, encounter different NPCs that represented NPCs as a non-playing character so it's just a character in the game um, so different characters who were suffering from different things so one mm. was rage and one was yeah. one was apathy and sure. all these different things and you know, here's this group of kids who have been through complex trauma in yeah. their childhood. That's why they're in this particular school. Yeah. And um, over the, the, the guy that we were, that we were his name is Peter. Um, and over and over and over again, you would see these kids um, put down their weapons and either try to teach the NPC mm -hmm. a skill uh, mm -hmm. like meditation. Yep. Um, or deep breathing, mm -hmm. or self-confidence skills, yeah. you know, kind of self-talk, you know, all these different skills that they had learned, yes. right? Yep. But the, you know, what surprised the staff was that they weren't getting that, like you sit in a therapy session and the kid doesn't, isn't Whatever. really getting yeah. anywhere, you know, they're not really getting anywhere with them. You put them in this construct mm -hmm. where they see somebody else that has a yes. similar thing and all of a sudden they are they're in it and yep. they're and they're and they're giving advice and, and compassion um, so it is a really unique um, way to to really teach kids not just to know the skills but just to, to even to practice them well and I mean, there's a reason why on a much uh, more simplistic level role-playing is something that gets used in counseling right. as, a, as a major way to help people begin right. to do it and we just take that a few steps further yeah. and uh, I think they're able to do more with it, but it's it's a good indication of how useful that can be yeah. uh, and how much people can get from it. So I think we're probably right at towards the end. Oh, okay. So I want you guys to tell people all about where they can find you, um, what you have sure. planned, anything that you might have going we on have for the plans. file. <laughs> uh, so there, there are a few things. So first off, dragonshaven.org yeah. is where you'll find us. Uh, we have a Facebook page as well uh, that you can find. If you go to Facebook and look up Dragon's Haven, you'll find us there too. Uh, but dragonshaven.org is our website. We keep that updated. There are pictures from a more recent event up there. By the time this video goes live, I expect that we'll also have a number of videos up there from our recent event. So if you'd like to see what we do and hear from some of the people who have done it and what their experiences were like, that'll be a great place to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll also be putting up announcements about future events as we get them set up there. Our plans going forward. This summer, we're still working on dates and location because we're last year, this this summer that we've done right now it has been our first time in full operation. Uh, we're brand new. Uh, we'll be converting over to nonprofit, and so we established as a 501c3 uh, going forward here. And we're setting up our uh, next summer's worth of camp. So in 2019, this is mm -hmm. 2018, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Still. It was still 2017. It was going to be bad. Uh, so in going into 2019, uh, we'll be setting up ideally two, two full weeks of summer camp. Uh, it'll be at an outdoor location like our last one was. So in cabins, we rented out a 4-H camp uh, last time, Camp Marshall, which is a wonderful facility. Uh, we may be back there again, depending on time and availability. So there'll be summer camp. We're also working now on putting together adventures during the year. Ideally, Saturday night adventures where the kids would go. We're actually talking to a couple different escape room companies uh, that may uh, we may be working with them to use their facilities. Uh, but where the kids would come Saturday night, they'd have the adventure part for most of Saturday night, and then you get a slumber party and board games and stuff and get picked up Monday uh, Sunday morning. Uh, so we're hoping to have at least a couple of those that we'll schedule. We'll make sure that information gets out at least uh, at least a month or two in advance. Awesome. So, Bite-sized uh, adventures, like the mini snippers. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, those actually work out better than I thought they would have. Yeah. Rather than the fun size Snickers, which yeah. are always, they just feel like uh, not an actual candy bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's most of what we've got going forward. Uh, there's also some phenomenal artwork that our artist, Eva Chelsberg, uh, who is insanely talented, uh, has up on the website, as well as a bunch of information about the lore of the world that we've created. Uh, I'll be a little conceited, I'm a little proud of it, but created it from scratch with the help of a number of wonderful people, Ariel included. Um, and the world is a very interesting one. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, and when kids uh, move into the world, they create a character from what we've got there. So if you're interested in any of the lore or the stories, the creative writing that might go along with it, take a look. Those are also skills that we help to, to work with kids on, uh, and we'll move forward from there. And if they're not in the local area, because we do mm -hmm. have people from yeah. around the country, how do they find a great program? You yeah. know, what do they look for in a program that's going to be a good place to, to you know, safe sure. place for their kids? Do you want me to take this one? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. There are a few things that I'd recommend. First, uh, are they a certified camp? That does make a difference. If they're still fairly small and they're, they're under, uh, under uh, 20 people or so, that's not as big an issue. But if they're large scale, are they a camp? Not necessarily ACA accredited because that's a really high threshold that not everyone uh, that's starting, that's trying to do more exotic things is going to be able to meet. But are they a camp? Second, what's their staff ratio? Uh, I like five to one is great. Ten to one is pushing it, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're looking for something like what we are providing. There are two questions. What their uh, ratio is in terms of counselors to kids is one question. The second question is what the ratio of staff to kids is or of cast members to kids and that's a separate deal. So one thing that we've done uh, that makes us distinct from some similar programs is we have a very expansive cast compared to our kids. Uh, we're, search we're looking for about a two to one or three to one ratio between total staff and kids right. whereas you may find other programs where that's closer to 10 to one or 15 to one. Uh, so look for a small ratio there. Also check the ages of the counselors. This will tell you a lot. There are programs that use younger and older counselors. There are tons of benefits to having younger kids involved. But if you're looking for delivery of educational content, that's something where a program that has counselors who are 20 and older, who have finished college or are in college, are more likely to be able to provide in an effective manner. Uh, there's also a big difference between uh, people who are good actors and people who are good teachers. There's overlap, uh, and there are some people who are great at both. But having one skill set doesn't mean you've got the other. In your cast members, you definitely want the, the actor part. In your counselors, you want the teacher part. Mm -hmm. So again, find out more about the counselors. Find out how many, if any of them, are classroom teachers right now or have been. That will tell you a ton about their ability to deliver that content. Finally, look for testimonials. Uh, find out from people who've been there as much as you are able. A lot of what makes the difference is the community that gets formed around it, uh, the values that they teach, and how they do that. So. Ask questions as much as possible. Have them walk you through a day. Ask about, uh, ask for stories of adventures the kids have had before, and also ask them what their goal is. What is the point in having the kids there? Because there are a number of places that will do uh, a sort of LARP summer camp sort of thing where the primary goal is for the kids to come and have a fun time doing this activity. And that's cool for what it is. It is very straightforward and it can have a ton of benefits. There's a deeper level that I think we and a few other places do, but is a little less common, and that's using that kind of immersive theater or LARP, live action role playing, as a tool for concrete educational purposes, whether they're academic or social, mm -hmm. and finding out what those are and how they achieve those ends, I think will go a long way as well. Awesome. Great advice. You guys, thank you so much. Thank you. I feel us. like I've known you a long time. <laughs> Uh, that news to me, but wonderful. I may have been in a coma and not known. You've been talking to me. Over time. No, yeah. I mean we just met, really. But yeah. uh, but it is. It's kind of you know. It, it, I always find it interesting when I uh, when I find other nerds mm -hmm. um, that we do kind of have that common ground of, yeah. that helps us kind of feel connected, I you know, agree. quickly. So thank you, yeah. uh, Let's Play Community, for watching and being with us today. Um, mm -hmm. If you're watching, if you're not watching this on the Let's Play group, you can find us through the Mastermind Adventures Facebook page up where it says group on the top right, um, that'll get you there. Or if you wanna go to um, a quick link, it's the uh, HTTP bit.ly slash MA Let's Play. Um, we are also gonna be having this in a podcast. Mm -hmm. So if you are listening to this on the podcast, please um, like the podcast and give us a review and tell us how you, how you liked it. It'll help us to 
get more viewers in and bring the joy of offline play to the majority of people that we can. So. I will plan the link to you off of our website. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Facebook we'll put well, all so. of the links in. Dragonshaven.org will get you there too. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll have that also in the show notes. So any yeah. of the things that we talked about today, we'll have in a blog post and, and it'll be there forever and ever on our website. So, all, all right. right. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. It's yeah. been a pleasure to speak Thank with you. you today. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you. Christine. Thanks for having me. Of course. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care, folks. Hope to see you in Haven.